Nene. And now that formalities are out of the way, ladies and gents, we can dive right into today's burning topic in collaboration with Fagu Kesi. The topic in discussion is the new media business of heritage stories. And one of the questions it seeks to unpack is how can a shared knowledge of the respective business and operating models between glams, content makers and broadcasters better empower commercial relationships in the future? <laughs> <laughs> And because I feel completely out of my depth discussing that with you, I'll be handing you over to the capable hands of Smoo Maneta. Hi, Smoo. Hey, Bliss. How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? It's been quite a minute. Been it has. A yeah. I mean, Yet you guys still managed to put all of this together. You know, lockdown, let's hack. We realized that there's some problems that glams were facing, you know, because of COVID as a matter of fact. So mm. we thought, let's find solutions, you know, to these institutions, especially when it comes to our cultural heritage. So... Definitely. 100%. Definitely. So, so what sort of like topic points are you looking forward to in today's discussion? I think the most important thing that we're looking forward to is learning. You know, we have such a great panelist that is going to share some great insights, but also just to come up, see if we can come up and share information and how we can really make our culture and heritage and also any other models that will make it more accessible, sustainable, you know. So how do we make sure that in making this accessible, how do we also make it sustainable? How do we secure that bag? How do we secure the Okay, okay, I'm not one to miss a lesson on how to secure the bag, so I'm going to grab my pencil and notebook and sit and listen attentively. Hopefully, you'll be doing the same. Um, until we meet up again, I'm leaving you in the capable hands of Smoo. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. As Blessed said, thank you very much, Blessing. As Blessed said, my name is Busiso Manenza, and I am the co-founder of Credipal. And today we're going to be having a wonderful conversation with a really strong panel uh, group that on, on really how we're going to be able to um, make sure that the new media and new business are going to be combined, um, especially when we, when we move into our cultural and heritage stories. So without further ado, I'm definitely going to be getting into it. And I think the one thing that we're definitely going to be doing is start introducing introducing our panelists. Um, and just before I get into introducing our amazing panelists, the first thing I'd like to do is thank you guys one more time for joining us. Um, our conversation is going to last 45 minutes. And then from that, we're going to encourage you as the team, as the viewers, please give us questions, please give us comments, put them on the Facebook and all the Guta or Credipal or as well as Fago Kesi. Please just make sure that you can give us comments and questions. And at the end, when we've had our conversation, we'll ensure that we can pass it over to the panelists and we'll answer them, uh, answer those burning questions one by one. All right, thank you very much. Let me just get into it then. So first that we have on our panelist, we have Dr. Geraldine Frisler and she's going to be joining us from the South African History Archive. Uh, welcome, Dr. Geraldine. Then next, we're also going to be having uh, a representative from District 6. I think quite a, a lot of you know about District 6 as well. And from that, we're also going to be having uh, Christian A. Julius, who's going to be joining us. Welcome, Christian A. Thank you so much for joining us. And then outside of then talking to the GLAM institutions, we're also going to have content creators. So we have a wonderful lady uh, by the name of Bogang Pelani, who's, also go who's an actress as well as a producer. And she's going to be giving us her input and her insights from a content creative, from a content creation side in terms of how difficult is it to make sure that we have the right information and access to this information when we're creating our content. And then last not least, we have a very important panelist as well, who's going to be joining us from the broadcasting side. Of course, we're talking about new media business, you know, so it is important that we have a business representative here and we're going to have a representative from Multi-Choice who's a commissioning editor uh, for, for, for Mzanti as well as for Showmax and, and One Magic and his name is Sanele Shibe. Uh, welcome to you all panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. We truly appreciate it. Um, without further ado then, I think we're going to get right into it and get into the burning questions that we have panelists. And Dr. Geraldine, I'm going to come to you first and asking this question. I think it's quite the interesting question. But the first question maybe that we should start off with, we're talking about cultural and uh, our cultural heritage. And my question to you is, how do we get the youth involved? I mean, we've seen with this hackathon, we've tried to get the youth involved as much as possible. So for you, you know, having been as part of the GLAM institution, how do you believe that we should get the youth involved? Do you believe it's an issue of access to these GLAM institutions? Or do you maybe believe that it's an, it's an issue of interest into our cultural heritage? Uh, maybe Dr. Geraldine, do you mind taking that first one for us? Um, in short, I think if we were to make cultural heritage more interesting, definitely through exhibitions, whether it's virtual or physical art, poetry, etc., cetera, um, then you, know, you would get more, you would pique the interest of the youth. 
uh, youth are, of course, the future cust custodians of uh, cultural heritage. However, given the many harsh realities uh, that I think um, Kekholo was talking about earlier that we're facing at the present, especially uh, youth, such as in unemployment, um, youth might of often be hesitant, or I wouldn't even call it hesitance. They just mm. might not be an appetite to think or appreciate cultural heritage in the present context. Uh, so I can argue that as human beings, it is of course absolutely essential that we have this interest in cultural heritage. But I think um, there's also a way that cultural, an interest in cultural heritage can be translated into having, um, into creating viable economic opportunities, which mm. Uh, will respond to the shifts in travel and mm. tourism as a consequence of the pandemic. So there's, a, you know, a, the, for every, they say for every kind of challenge, there's opportunity in that. So one of, one of those ways is, of course, to apply technology and mm. bring heritage from the archive vaults and shelves. And that being said, though, even though unemployment is alarmingly high, Mm. Uh, as human beings, we do need cultural heritage. Um, and lastly, most glam institutions, especially in South Africa, and I, I would guess on the continent, face the problem of access, uh, whether it's because of limitations in terms of resources, and that can mm. be human resources, financial um, difficulties, uh, technology, infrastructure, which makes it difficult to create access to knowledge. Yeah. And even when there is access, there's also the question of the affordability for institution to maintain mm. uh, digi that, that digital knowledge. But, and then also for the users, and that's for the public, of this information to have the resources to be able to acquire this knowledge, which mm. you can get from the in internet, but you need money to be able to buy data, etc. cetera. Yeah. So I, I'm glad Telcom is here and I'm hoping that Telcom... <laughs> Salsi, MTN, and Vodacom is listening. And in, in, in anybody else who's coming on the market to think about, you know, that data is absolutely expensive in South Africa. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think a key, a key take out that I really take from that is we won't be able to do this alone. It is actually quite vital that if we're going to try and solve this problem, we try and do that with all the stakeholders that are going to be necessary to helping solve this problem. And I think if you even mentioned Telcom, I mean, they, they're quite committed and I hope that they take this commitment, not just obviously with this hackathon, but they take it further in terms of making sure that whatever ideas come from this hackathon, that they, they can be executable and accessible, which is another conversation that you had mentioned. So thank you for that. There's also a lot of key points that you'd mentioned around profit, but I'll come into that. There's a lot of questions that I wanna ask on that um, to that. So I'll definitely come to you. Thank you for that. I maybe wanna come to Sanele next, um, if you don't mind, because you've actually touched on a few things as we talk about access and interest. So maybe coming to you, Sanele, you know, media, has long ultimately been a platform for education when it comes um, to cultural and heritage information. And a lot, of, a lot of the times it's done to drama series, it's done drama series, it's done through films and all those kinds of things. So we actually mm -hmm. have an amazing uh, drama series that Bokang is actually part of, which is Blood Psalms, you know, that uh, show is gonna be coming onto show, Max. So my question to you is how much interest is there from the public locally for content that speaks to our culture and heritage um, and maybe if I can take it a bit further as well, is how much interest do you know of, is there outside of the country and the continent as well for our culture and heritage information? Just from your standpoint, if you don't mind sharing that, sir. Look, I think the one thing that makes us all unique as a, as a society is our respective cultures, right? So the one, everyone can speak English, but not a certain, only a certain type of people dress a certain way, you know, and yeah. what I've noticed is that within our stories as multi-choice, the stuff that does really, really well for us is the stuff that is based, rooted in, in culture. You look at channels like GakeNet that are yeah. breaking boundaries. You look at channels like Mzansi Magic, which are always like, you know, just crossing and bridging that divide. It's because people want to see their culture reflected. Um, on screens, you know, they want to see themselves. And what broadcasting is so important in the in the in the essence that um, it's like a snapshot in in time, if you know what I mean. So it's yeah. like we 
what, whatever moment you take right now, that's the representation of our people at this present moment in time that we can always go back to and say, in 2020, this is how people dressed, looked, spoke, <laughs> acted, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. it's quite an important medium. And with, with regards to, to the blood sounds, the thing that excites me the most is that we are finally, I think, as, as Africans, reclaiming our Africa and our identity. And what yes. I mean by that is that we are telling and showing Africa in a way that's never been shown before, because most of the time it was usually spoken or shown uh, via a very particular lens, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so now we are in charge of our own representation as, as Africans. And if you see the costumes, the language, the, the nuance, you know, yeah. and that is what people want to see, you know, yeah. shows like Game of Thrones, for instance, and it's not just a South African thing, but it's it's an international thing because shows like Game of Thrones do well because they yeah. portray a culture that we have never particularly interacted with or seen before. Yeah. So new media is important in the sense that it can take us to those spaces, you know, and yeah. the interest in Blood Psalms has shown me that when, whenever you, people see the trailer or they hear that um, I'm working on it or they hear the language and they hear whatever's being spoken about in the trailer, the first thing they, they are like, yo, I've never seen a world like this before. I've never mm -hmm. seen an Africa like this before. I didn't know Africans could dress like this because they were yeah. always, or Africa was always represented in a particular way within, within society and via a particular lens. So what, what excites me is the whole representation of culture in, in the show. And the interest has been there. Um, and it's been quite a lot, like even, so whether it's um, normal people who don't work in TV, who are just like, yeah. when is this thing gonna come out? I need to see this because yeah. it's something I've never seen before, but it's also something that I recognize because I recognize the language, I recognize the behavior, I recognize yeah. the actors, the faces that are there, but I've never seen them being represented in, in this way. And I think, uh, yeah, Bokang did a, did an amazing job there, uh, portraying um, you know one of one of the key characters, which is also another yeah. aspect of representation, like the representation of women. Yes, it was always if yes. you read history, you always read like that women uh, were treated or subjugated a certain way. But if yeah. you actually go back into history, you actually realize that with the Shaga Zulu story, uh, it was his aunt that was actually the kingmaker. The kingmaker, yes. Put, the kings on the throne and dethroned them. You know what I mean? She, she was the orchestrator. Yes, Shaga went there to fight and whatever, and he's hailed as yeah. the greatest king ever. But would he have even been there had it not been for his aunts? Aunts. So any so, questions? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so so those are the kind of those are the kind of aspects of history and representation that always excite me about the show. And you know, it, it's it's. I think it's so across, like one of the biggest shows that we had was Isibaya, which portrayed authentic Zulu culture and Zulu characters in, in a way that's never been seen before. You know, in a way you had all of a sudden Brent Woods came onto TV. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the Zulu language, which was, was kind of like romanticized and made poetry instead of like a language of violence and, yeah. and, and, and it was like made poetic and beautiful and, you know, so, and people just immediately gravitated and connected to that because that was the representation that they one knew. And that was also the representation that they aspired to. So I've said a lot, but the long and short of it is that the representation in Blood Psalms and the representation of our own unique culture and the rep representation of our identity as African being told in a way that is, is different and unique, but is also I will put this in inverted commas, true is what makes people get interested in following and in knowing the history because you, mm -hmm. are, you, you are no longer, um, what is this? You are no longer painted as a gangster, as a thief, as a failure, as a dropout, but you are painted as to what you could be and what you could aspire to be if you embody certain values that they always teach us at home, right? <laughs> it's not even that different. Like, the value of perseverance, the value of doing good in the, in the world that is, you know, infested or maybe covered by evil, you know, the value of yeah. not taking the lesser choice, but taking the hard choice, which is things that we all know. But yeah. once it's put there on screen and put with people that we recognize and aspire to be, then it what becomes 
communication most important. Easier, you know, for us to connect with it. And yeah, local is local is great, man. I'd advocate for local anytime because we can mimic anything everywhere, but only we have our own nuance and our own culture and our own language and our own identity, which is what's going to make people then start to come into the country because they want to see exactly what it is that we have and what makes us unique. And they also want to, um, in inverted commas, experience this culture with us. Definitely. I think maybe on that, you know, Sanel, you've mentioned so many key points. One I'm going to take from that is number one, representation. You know, I'd come in and I'd asked you about the fact that broadcast plays a, a big role in also making sure, and, and, and content as well, has a big role in educating the people, but it's not just about the education. The education matters if there's the right representation, because in that, then all the nuances come out that really matter, you know, certain things that um, otherwise would not have known. So thank you so much on that. And I think actually on, on that, maybe this is the perfect time for me to come to you, Bokang, you know, and, and let's maybe just have this conversation then, because I mean, you, as the actress, as one of the leads as well, played a big role in speaking about that representation, you know, and telling the story as the way it needs to be told. But then my question maybe comes to you, it's, it's a two part question, I guess is one, why do you feel the need as a content creator that we should be creating these kinds of content? And then possibly secondly, in terms of when you're creating these contents, because you also come from a producer's mindset. So how do we make sure that we get the right information? You know, where do we go to get the right context so that when we write the scripts and we tell the story, we tell it as accurate as possible. Maybe if you wanna take that one, Bokang. Unmute please, Bokang. Yes, could you please unmute Boka? And also just while we're also waiting, please uh, to anyone, everybody that's gonna be watching all across the world, because we know that this is being streamed all across the world, please don't forget to give us your comments and your questions. Uh, Boka? Okay, so the first part of your question was, is how do we... Um, Why do you feel... You the, sorry. Yeah, definitely. Why do you as a content creator feel like you should be creating these kinds of content. You know, where does it come from to really want to tell these stories? Why do you feel like it's important? I feel like it's important because, you know, we need to see ourselves. We need to be able to imagine ourselves. And it's been mentioned before, Sanle has also mentioned it, and um, that, you know, at the moment, the, the way that we see ourselves, the African story, the African child, um, is in a very particular way. And in order for us to one day be, you know, what we imagine ourselves to be in the fullest glory of ourselves, we need to see ourselves in different perspectives. So we need to see ourselves in be, being the victor, being the person who transforms, even being the bad guy so that we have, you know, an experience that allows us to grow. Definitely. You know, just, sorry. Yes, proceed. No, 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 please. I was just going to say there's a quote that we were talking about, you know, if, uh, if the lion doesn't learn to tell the story, uh, the story will always glorify the hunter. So it's just something that I thought, you know, I should track into. True, true. And human beings, you know, human beings are very unique in the sense that we literally make ourselves. It's, we, we tell our own future as, as, as we receive ourselves from the history. So it's so important that we leave ourselves references for the expansion that we want to be, which is the importance of filmmaking when it comes to culture and when it comes to all the things that we've inherited with our culture, which is essentially our, our heritage. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Maybe then let's go into the next part of my question. And thank you for that, Bokang. You know, um, thank you. Leaving references is also another very good context. So thank you so much for that. It's so important, obviously, to leave references, you know, to, to have something that we can look back and to be like, look, this is how it was done. This is who we are, yes. you know, and, and it's very, very important. So thank you for that. But then my next question then coming into that, you know, when you talk about references, we have GLAM institutions that currently exist. GLAM for anyone, you know, who may not know is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Mm -hmm. So we have GLAM uh -huh. institutions which are custodians of this information. Now, from the producer's mm -hmm. perspective, when you are doing the research that's necessary for, to make sure that we can tell the story accurately, because obviously it's important to tell the story as accurate as possible. How do mm -hmm. you then, guys, how do you guys get that information? Where do you go currently? You know, how do you make sure that your research is accurate? Well, the number one source is, um, well, two number one sources. When it comes to our culture and heritage and stuff like that, it's more important as a filmmaker, I feel, for you to keep your pulse on the ground. So 
the, the best resource for you would be the people, the everyday lives of the people. And secondly, the internet. The internet is when I want to make treatments and all of that stuff, or when I'm researching into my characters, I will go to search on the internet. Mm -hmm. So um, with, with the internet in particular, you know, it's quite challenging because really representation is, is quite limited for black people. If, uh, just if, to give you a simple example, if I want to search black, um, Prince. Black girl. Yes. Sorry, what's that? I was just saying Black Prince, you know, or Black King or anything along those lines. Oh, yeah, Black Prince, Black King. What's going to appear is um, different variations or different races of a Black King, but not really what I'm looking for, just a king wearing black or yeah. a king in a black and white um, um, graded photo. Just not what I'm looking for, just not the representation of I'm looking for an African king or, or a Black King. So I've always felt like, you know, the internet could be more populated with, re with accurate representations of what we are. Definitely. Thank you so much for that, Bokang. Um, I, I really, really appreciate your comments. And I actually want to come back to you on, on something you said at the end, but I'll definitely come to you. But for now, I just want to quickly go to Christian A, you know, because you've just mentioned there's obviously it's our importance. And I think everyone has said that it's important that we tell our story. It's our responsibility to ensure that we tell our story. And then, of course, it's important that we go and find the right references, the right resources. So maybe, Christian, just coming to you, my question then ultimately is, you, you're, you're, you're part of District 6. So you head up District 6, as a matter of fact. You know, and, you, and there's a lot of information uh, sitting in your, in your institution. But now my question would be, the most important thing for you is to obviously stay sustainable, you know, to make sure that the ship always stays running and people can get paid and everything along those lines. So my question ultimately to you is, how have you guys been currently, pre-COVID especially, staying alive? You know, what have been the revenue mechanisms that you guys had, um, ha had been taking a part of to make sure that you guys can stay alive? And then secondly, I mean, now looking at what COVID has done, <clears throat> How do you see what are the other mechanisms that we could possibly uh, go to, you know, while that we go into the next phase or the new world as we're talking about that? Okay, thanks. Um, so I think, you know, with the, with the pandemic, I think what we've really experienced is that the museum lost all feet through the door. We weren't able to host schools. Um, and that really sort of impacted in terms of how we traditionally generate our income. And I think during the six months of lockdown, um, we thought, well, let's look at ways of fundraising, you know, in the traditional ways, um, making direct appeals to the public, um, having on, sort of um, fundraising events and those kinds of stuff. But it's really been a, a challenge in the sense of during lockdown, while there was a financial crisis with the museum, at the same time, were, we had a crisis that we weren't able to reach our audience. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't really have a sort of very active, um, social media presence, um, we weren't any apps that people could access to sort of visit the museum while lockdown was happening. And we didn't have the resources to do that, to create that during lockdown as well. Um, yeah. We're an independent institution, we're not funded by the state. And so our resources are, you know, spread very thin. Wow. And so I think, so there's, there's something I always think of, you know, there's the hopeful answer that, you know, post -loc lockdown, that we are able to think of ways that people can access our archive, our exhibitions, our sort of education programs, yeah. um, sort of, but in ways that can actually be monetized. And it's a difficult decision for us because as a community museum, um, we don't want to see our work as needing to be monetized. We want our public mm -hmm. access to be free. We want people to access our resources, our educational resources for free. And what has been really, I think, eye-opening in terms of the hackathon and participating has understanding how in a digital space you can monetize certain areas within the of material that you make available to the public. Um, and you can then create an online community that is able actually to, they won't bring in the hundreds of millions, but if you build that community, um, they can sort of contribute to the sustainability of the museum financially. Yeah. And I think also just in terms of creating a new audience. Um, so I would like to think that um, the revenue mechanisms are something that I think we've been really been exposed to during this process with the, with the hackathon. Um, and then obviously the challenge as an independent museum who's, you know, wanting to sustain a building, salaries, yeah. exhibitions, how do we actually make sure that that happens post hackathon and do yeah. it in a way that is respectful, I think, also of our archive and the kind of archive that it is. It's an archive about a, a, a thematic 
time in people's lives. Um, and so, so I think we, we're excited by the possibilities. Thank you so much for that. I think you, you raised quite a key, a key message there in the terms of technology and the digital landscape will help in twofold. One, with raising awareness, which is the most important thing, you know, so that people now know, especially I suppose I could maybe even speak about the youth, but just the general population can now know that, hey, District 6 exists and this is what we do and this is the kinds of information that we hold, things that are very important to you. So thank you for sharing that. But not only could it help with awareness, but secondly, could also help in making sure that, well, how could we come up? I mean, we're talking new media business now and new media is just new media overall in the way in which we consume media and, and new media in terms of just how media is, is currently shaped, you know? So those are very key conversations and thank you for that. But just sticking on that digital landscape, maybe as we come into the next question, um, and I'll come to you, Dr. Geraldine, for this, um, because, you know, of course you're also part of Saha. And I, my question to you ultimately is, how do you see the digital landscape assisting before we even get there, I mean, the digital landscape is changing continuously. It's always changing. It's ever, things are always new coming. And it's so difficult sometimes to keep track of the new solutions and technical, um, yeah, technical solutions that are coming out there. So my question to you, just being part of the glam as well, is how do you see technology and the new digital landscape changing things for glam organizations, especially when it comes to awareness and revenue? I think you may Thank be, you. there we go. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, hear All right. Um, yeah, that's, that, that is a serious question that would need some unpacking, but I'm gonna try and be uh, short sure. on that. Um, yeah, the, I think what Chris says, uh, Chris Shanae has spoken about earlier, touches on a few things that several um, GLAM institutions that are also independently functioning, uh, you know, do not get any state funding, is solely reliant on donor funding. Um, and I would almost say it's an it's a, it's a NGO culture of mm -hmm. where, um, you know, uh, and it stems from a long history of activism where you um, make your material freely available, uh, accessible mm -hmm. to, the, to the public. There's almost no charge, but then that in turns impact on your sustainability of the organization. Um, so I think what probably Saha and uh, District 6 Museum and, uh, and a few other GLAM institutions in South Africa suffer from, suffer in, in inverted commas, yeah. um, because it's by choice. Yeah. But there's a definite, we need to move away from that model of thinking um, that you, that that's the only way of um, getting, creating access and awareness of information that, you know, in terms of respecting your material and being ethical, having ethical considerations, that is key to it. But I would also argue that um, now, to move to a, to a model of more financial sustainability, especially when organizations want to remain independent. So we need as NGOs to make that shift, that mental shift, Definitely. that it is okay to charge a small fee for reproductions, um, you know, where people can afford it. And in terms of your actual question, sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you. That was um, a perfect answer about it, but thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, it was just, you know, going through my head. So I just uh, thought I, I needed to respond um, just to reiterate what Chris was saying. Um, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's multiple ways that digital, the digital landscape and um, digital technology can enhance and facilitate um, in bringing and facilitating bringing cultural and historical material out of yeah. archives and museums because it needs to sit obviously uh, taking, um, being considerate of issues like privacy and third party information, all those things that GLAM institutions need to think about, um, but then making this information available in very innovative and creative ways because let's face it, um, 
youth of today want packaged curated information they, it needs to be two clicks yeah even that is made probably too much um <laughs> they, they, they don't you know that is just how um short attention the, uh, well I, i'm not gonna commit myself to saying that <laughs> and get a get um hate mail from um millennials um so no <laughs> i'm just you know, we live in a culture where things are fast and convenient. So yeah. people, if you're not going to become an academic, you don't want to go and, and do the, the dirty work of researching piles and piles of materials to get through. So, you know, I think if we as GLAM institutions start to think about it like that and then have, I hate to say it, curated experiences <laughs> for people... <laughs> then you know um it's it's it, at the end of the day it's not about the people behind the curtain doing yeah. the production work it's about the user at the end on the user side of the website yeah um how accessible is your information how friendly is it um you know um and at the end of the day it's it's about contributing to knowledge i would think um i would love someone to be able to get access to, um, you know, um, any co particular collection on our website mm. um, in somewhere in the Northern Cape where it's in the middle of nowhere, but they do not do not have to come all the way to Johannesburg to see what is in the archive. It will be at their disposal or yeah. they can at least see samples or, or snippets of what is in the um, collection. And at the same time, um, I think what needs to be created is also to build in capacity. Um, yes. You know, um, and I don't know what form it would take, um, but, you know, it's, it, it, it can't start after school. It has to start at school, from primary school, in tandem with GLAM institutions on mm -hmm. how, for example, um, how would you create an exhibition or how would you do an oral history um, yeah. interview with your grandmother, for example, things like that, small things. So there are definite ways in, in, in which technology can be utilized in order to get to that goal. Definitely. You know, thank you so much for that. I think on your last points as well that you had mentioned, you know, how do we, oh, the one point that I want to go back to, which is your question is how do we get to tell the stories of our grandmothers and grandfathers who aren't necessarily online, but they have a wealth of information, such a wealth of information about our current and our past that could really help us shape our future, you know, because we're going to have that, that key context. And I think that's such an important thing, which maybe even is perfect in leading into the next question, which Bokang, I'm going to come to you for this question. And then possibly I'm also then going to ask Krishine about this too, because it ultimately has to do with content creators working with glam organizations now i mean it is mentioned here that there's so much information that exists you know and it's our responsibility to tell our information but then my question being that in the absence of some of our information being digitized in the absence of some of our archives and our collections being digitized you know it's important that we obviously need to still access them so my question to you bokang has been what have been some of the sticky uh, issues or what, has, what are the, some of the things that have made it a little bit difficult for you to operate and work and collaborate with GLAM organizations? Because it is important that we collaborate and work with them, you know, as we tell the story. So maybe from your point, can you share what have been some of your difficulties? And then maybe I'll go to Krishna after that. Thank you. Um, I think uh, access to the to the glam organizations is uh, the first uh, difficulty and i think to be honest and today so i there's a bell there's a church um right by where i live the bell is going i'm sorry if that's distracting you no, that's, it's, anyway. yeah, that's okay. it's church time but that's okay. <laughs> okay okay uh where was i oh yes i was saying that uh, another um, a thing that i'm picking up especially today is shall i just proceed Yes, please, please, I can hear you properly. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, internet is a bit of a sticky one. So maybe can we go to Krishine for this one? Sorry about that. I think uh, internet is not being offering. Krishine, maybe can we come to you? Uh, same question. 
Um, you know, especially with now that as you've been working with some of the hackathon and hackathon participants, what have been some of the issues that you've picked up when it comes to working with content creators so that they can ensure that they can tell the story? Um, is, it, is it wrong to say that I didn't experience that many challenges? Um, I think that in terms of the, the way in which people interpreted the data that we sent, for example, I think for us it was, it was quite an exciting thing to see people connecting with um, a districtic story, which is a really sort of local South African story, and people were able to sort of pick up on um, the values of District 6, what made this place so special. And I think for me, that was actually, it wasn't a challenge. It was, it, it was just a reminder that storytelling, sharing stories, um, collaborating and understanding sort of human values is the thing that's going to sort of drive how we use technology and why we want to sort of make things accessible um, for users. Um, I think the challenges on our side, it's always, it links back to, to what um, was said earlier is that it is difficult for sort of glam institutions when um, 25 years later, they're still in different kinds of processes of transformation or they are independent institutions. And so they still operate in very traditional ways in terms of where the archive is located. It's not necessarily digitized. Um, and from our side, that is, that is the challenge. It's about the, the, the skills, are, the skills are apparent, um, the platforms are apparent but the GLAM institutions are sort of lagging in terms of their own capacity in actually providing information that is ready to be used, um, let alone curated. Um, and I think so from our side, that is actually, um, it's a real challenge, I think, um, in creating new content. We know the content is there, but who's going to do it? We need, we need skilled, um, I think, um, I was going to say museum staff, but yeah, we need skilled staff on the GLAM ends to be able to enable that access to that information. And I think that is going to, that, that hasn't been thought of strategically amongst museums and perhaps even hasn't been really strategically supported by the state as well. Um, and so I think it's going to be a real challenge um, to do it. And I just want to make the point that, and interestingly enough, as an independent museum, the means we have less bureaucracy in, in sort of working with content creators. And so we don't have to necessarily go through a whole state bureaucracy um, to sort of get skills resources in. We can directly apply for funding, we can make things happen. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic to be in. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, and I think, yeah, I've got a little bit more questions, but I think it's very important uh, that we obviously start going to some of the questions that have been asked. I know there's some dying questions that have been coming out. I'm just gonna ask my technical team if they could assist me with my questions, if you don't mind. Um, but I think, thank you so much, um, Krishine and the panel for that. Um, I think I definitely would also like to come back to some of the things. Um, uh, I'd like to come up to some of the things. I maybe have one more question, and then I'm going to quickly go to 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 to. I'm going to quickly go to the questions then. And this question is ultimately going to be maybe to Dr. G Dr. Geraldine to you. I want to quickly then ask you, having an understanding of how COVID is now looking, um, and we've got a new world coming forward. How do you how do you foresee the role of Glam Partners going forward now, especially knowing that there's a lot of collaboration that's going to come into place. Um, I think it's it's very exciting. Um, I think um, traditionally, I might be wrong, uh, but for South African History Archive, and I know certainly uh, District 6 Museum and a few other GLAM institutions, uh, mm -hmm. often when there's like-minded projects, these institutions part partner up with other institutions on similar kind of projects. Um, which is not the norm. The norm is usually that institutions work in silos and I think that is dead wrong. Um, I think uh, there's a greater pool of skills and resources if institutions one or two or three, even the most, um, um, you know, I'm thinking about a project that Saha partnered on last year, which was with about three other institutions. Um, and in terms of that, I think a project is so much more successful um, when institutions are willing to do that. But yeah. then that being said, you know, we all are kind of clamoring for uh, the same funding in a yeah. very small pie. And that often, you know, puts us at different spectrums. Um, um, but at the same time, um, 
we need to work more closely together and not see each other as competition. Um, I think that is, you know, what um, independent institutions sh should also start to think about. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm digressing, I'm sorry. It's no, 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 that's okay, please, it's perfect. Your, yeah, um, just re remind me again, the essence of your last question. Just, so I was just asking about the role. How do you see the role of GLAM institutions sure. going forward, yeah. especially when that forward. there's tech, you know, there's digital sure. world, there's content creators, just what do you see your role? Yes, yeah, so I mean, definitely COVID is going to change it. We won't probably won't be having tourism um, return to South Africa for some time. Yes. You know, um, Europe is just going through its second wave and um, from the last pandemic that, uh, you know, virtually swept through the globe for around two years. So this is probably the same duration. So in terms of that, um, I think technology will really help in still bringing experiences across the globe yeah. in terms of the limitations in travel and tourism now. So, um, and then also then to create a way in how you will, and I hear Krishna when she says about the ethical considerations, Yeah. Um, but to do that in an ethical way, but still in a way that creates a revenue stream for an institution. I believe that there are ways it just, you know, you need to look at how uh, this can be done ethically and responsibly and tastefully. Ooh. Man, this is some beautiful comments. Uh, I'm actually <laughs> glad that we have the right people that had worked on this um, within the hackathon. I'm not going to lie. Um, we had a wealth of information and a wealth of um, ideas coming from all over the continent and I mean, as is credible, we, we had put the question of open cultural data on the map, you know, and speaking about open cultural data is obviously making it freely accessible and open, but in that when things are open and accessible, we also need to make sure that we protect and preserve. So those are very, very important points that you'd put in. I think maybe this is a good time. Thank you to my team. This is a good time for me to quickly go into some questions that come um, from the people outside. So uh, the question, one question that comes from Anonymous is, when we speak of cultural heritage and history, it's an ever evolving discussion as our cultures anonymously adapt and evolve. In what ways does globalization and or colonization or colonial history play within our cultural heritage and how we move forward with it? Oh, that is a beautiful question. And I'd like to maybe yeah. leave that to Krishine, uh, to yourself, Dr. Gerald, even Sanele, please, I'd like to everybody, I'd like to, um, anyone can take this question. Maybe if I can come to you. I uh, can take that. Oh, yes, please, Bogan, go ahead. I think, you know, that's such a, an interesting question. A question, a lovely question, in fact. I think <laughs> that, you know, um, because our culture, culture and heritage is something that's ever evolving. It dips through the past, it dips through the present in order to, you know, create itself in the future. And yeah. I think the role of colo colonization on our culture and heritage is that it, 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 it provides a, a particular lens in which we can see ourselves, which influences what we can be, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why it is important. It's, it's been mentioned a lot today in this conversation, which is something I'm, I'm glad about. It's important that we are creating um, avenues, ways, we're having the conversations about appreciating and learning more about ourselves, preserving our culture, because it is the lens that we're going to use in order to start to redefine ourselves. Because this is what it's all about. Even us investing more in our cultures, more in our heritage, is just so, so that we can reinvent ourselves, we can imagine ourselves anew. Definitely. You know, thank you for that, Bokang. That was a great, great answer. I'm maybe going to go into the next I'd, question. I'd also like uh, to dip into yes, that please, question. Yes, please, I'm going to come a... with the next one as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such an important question to ask. And I think the one thing that we need to um, know and understand is that the whole colonial, um, colon, colonial question comes in when we, when we talk about the structural, um, the structural uh, things that kind of create that culture or that kind of intersect with culture, right? So, mm -hmm. 
and and you see like so the infrastructure in South Africa, for instance, because we were one of the first countries to have film, I think in the 19, mm -hmm. 1912 here. So we've got the oldest film industry and we were able to benefit of that, you know, but some yeah. countries or some cultures, some people may not have the same the same access, you know, and when it comes to things like colonialism, we need to look at also the the the, the, the fundamental um, things that have had an impact on some people being able to participate in the creation of culture and other people being unable to participate in the creation of, of that new culture. So for instance, some people get left behind and yeah. the dominant uh, people, the ones who have access to all of this uh, structural infrastructure are the ones that are able to then shape history and shape culture because they are the ones that have the, the means for representation. So what we need to do, I think as society, how it all intersects, like intersects, like what I'm saying is that we need to give everyone a voice, you know, a, a voice in the representation so that everyone has a chance to represent themselves. Because if you are alive, but you don't have access to, for instance, you don't have a camera in this day and age, you don't have a camera, mm -hmm. you don't have video, you don't have um, electricity, you don't have, uh, running water, you don't have internet, can you really represent yourself in this day and yeah. age, you know? Accurately. You Thank you so much for that, Sanel. Thank you so much for that. I actually want to come to you with the next question, please, as well. Um, and I think it's very fitting because you also speak about infrastructure, resources, which is so important. And I have a question here, actually, from, 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 the, from the community, which is, how do the broadcast and film environments collaborate with glam spaces? And I think that's a very important for you, a very question for you, Sanela, you know, because I think you guys, not even I think, you guys are obviously responsible about for giving the people those voices, you know, giving those production houses the voices so that they can tell the stories accordingly. So how do you then uh, envision your guys in your role, especially commissioning editor, with partnering with glam institutions and content creators like Bokang? Such a good question. Uh, I'll try. I'll try give you the short answer and the summarized version, right? So, we as so, the things that we as we as a broadcaster, especially within the multi-choice space, our we are a paid TV subscription, right? So, with that comes things like um, the commercial the commercial availability of it, and we are also trying to. If you look at a broadcast uh, as well. You can also look at a broadcaster as a glam institution because we've got, I think as of late, we've got over 7,000 um, hours worth of content, you know, that is sitting within our own library. So when people look at glam institutions, they shouldn't leave out the broadcasters and say the broadcaster is a broadcaster. We are also custodians. If you want stuff from like the 2010 World Cup, for instance, that Sipuya Shabalala goal, you can yeah. also come to us and we'll you know, we'll, we'll supply you with that. So we, so our collaboration with GAM institutions, um, I wouldn't say there is a direct relationship, but there is kind of an indirect relationship where we are always undergoing research, research and development to see, okay, what happened, how true and how factual are these events and are the stories that we are telling. And then with, with for instance, things like, um, we, we do ethnographic studies as well, where we do, we sit with our audience. You also ask them what they like and all of those things. And then with uh, people like Bokang who are producers, we always look at the, the, the symbolism of like, is she dressed in the appropriate way? Is how is her nuance, you know, and when she portrays a character. And as a producer, if we always say that um, the truth is always stranger than fiction, right? So yes, we work in a fictional space, but yeah. we always look at, what is true about what the producer is bringing in? Is there a message in there that is universally true? Or is there, can we, can we look at things that have happened in the past, you know, to kind of inform the story that the producer is coming with? And how can we then merge those two? Because you find that sometimes, um, especially in storytelling, you might find that the best stories are actually stories that, um, that are based off real events or real life, but they are just, dramatized so you don't you don't go and imagine a scenario but what you do is that you you take a scenario that has happened and then you dramatize it and make it entertaining for television and for an audience to watch so 
that is that is the relationship so the first answer is that one you can look at a broadcast as a glam institution because uh, SABC recently, they, it's just unfortunate it was terminated, but they had a, the Encore channel, which had yeah. their stuff from the very, very beginning up until yeah. up until now, you know, and if you still, as a producer, if you want these things, we've, we've supplied a lot of historical, as multi choice, we've supplied a lot of the historical footage to producers to incorporate into their shows so that it, it feels and looks um, more real within their world of story as well. So we do act as a glam institution and at, on the flip side of that we do also work with production companies when we ask them to go research and go look at those archives and look at history and look at what is true today and we also conduct our own research as well i hope that answers your the the, the question it really does thank you so much Senela. i i myself actually learned quite a couple of things um so yes it really does thank you so much for that um that was very very insightful um, oh, the questions are coming in thick and fast, so maybe I'll just uh, quickly go to one more question. Um, uh, so the question here is, is audience education a key objective when shows like Blood Psalms are developed or produced? Uh, that probably is going to go back to you again, Sanel, I guess. The, the beautiful thing about stories is that you don't have to say, hey, I'm teaching you this and this, right? So I'll take you back to how stories first initiated and why us human beings find storytelling such so powerful is that when we were still living in the savannah, uh, before we, we, you know, we, when we just climbed down on the trees and we were living in the open savannah and we'd live in tribes, right? So then, but then you'd find that some of, some people from the tribe would go and hunt and then it'd come back, right? Yeah. And then villages would intersect and then you'd come across these villages. So, when you were going to hunt and you met the villagers that were coming back, they tell you, no, listen, um, if you go straight here and you pass a rock, there's going to be a rock on the ground. Yeah. Don't go to the left of the rock, go to the right of the rock, because if you go left, that's where you'll meet a den of lions and hyenas and you'll probably get eaten, you know? Yeah. And, but if you go right, then there's a clear passage, there's food and water for eons until you get to the pack of uh, antelope or deer or whatever that you're going to hunt. And yeah. stories then became a fundamental thing for our survival, right? Okay. And because we as human beings are meaning making machines, we will derive meaning from even the most mundane things, right? So even from entertainment, you will look at a music video, you'll derive meaning. You'll look at a, yeah. a, a short one minute skit, you'll find meaning. You'll look at a, a a webinar you'll find meaning so we as human beings are always creating meaning so it's not about for instance audience uh, awareness or what what is what the term they use audience education as much yeah. but it's more about how compelling and how great is a story and how relatable are your characters because from there what what i've noticed is that if we are all sitting at home and my mom is there her grandkids are there and i'm there She'll, if there's a storyline with the young people and the young person does something bad and something bad happens to them, she'll tell the young people, you see, this is what happens, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? So that, so that is the power of stories in that if you make them entertaining and engaging, us as the audience will always derive some kind of meaning from it anyway, because it's impossible to tell a story with no meaning, no matter how mundane you might think it is. Thank you so much for that, Sanele. Um, I can think I I'm also add to that? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, after you, then I can definitely wrap it up. Definitely, please, Boka. I actually love the way that Sanele answered that question. You don't have to tell people that you're educating them in order to educate them. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is by Nina, Nina Simone, where she says, by hook or by crook, we're going to educate the people about themselves. So. And particularly with shows like Blood Sums, I think the beauty of it is in the power of suggestion that comes with, um, you know, creative license. So yeah. with uh, Blood Sums, for example, uh, the, 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 the different tribes are uh, refer reference the tribes that we have in Southern Africa, but they're also quite broad. Yeah. And the beauty of that is you can leave a little seed of inception to be like, here's a vision of Africa or of yourself that you've never seen before. And then we use uh, names that actually exist, that names that are, um, prominent figures before in our African cultures. It may not be true to the story, but such a name exists. And what we've done now is we've left a seat for the audience to go find out 
who this person was, to go learn about the story and all of that and find out that the, the, the real actual history behind it. So, I mean, the aim is always to entertain, but I think that education will always be a large part of it. Yeah, thank you for that. And I suppose the term edutainment <laughs> is what really yes. I, I take from this, you know, um, entertain people because storytelling has always been woven in the way in which we tell, you know, our stories to, our, to the next generation because it's the best understood and we love to dream and imagine. So that's, that's really uh, appreciative. Thank you so much for that. Unfortunately, we're going to have to- And then I'd just like to add one more thing, sorry. Sure. Just to say regarding uh, the collaboration with the DLAM organization, I think then with, with for example, shows like Blood Sums, where there's a lot of historical references, but some of them are steeped in creative licenses. Then we can create structured segues, you know, to say, if you want to learn more about this character, then uh -huh. we guide them to the, to the museum or the, uh, that, that has a lot of information on that region or that character, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there just needs to be a more of a direct communication or initiative between filmmakers and them organizations to say how can we come together and 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 push our cultures and our culture and heritage forward which i suppose this this is what this conversation is about it really is and i really hope that we're able to at least dig into a little bit in terms of some of the solutions you know to everybody that's watching i hope we're able to dig into a little bit more into some of the solutions um that we could apply you know and wanting to tell our stories a lot more so thank you so much for work for that work gang, and thank you to the panelists unfortunately i'm going to have to close it there this has been so interesting this has been amazing but before we go off i think it's very important that we go to final comments to everybody in the panel it, it, there was the, ins the insights were so amazing, but I think it is important. And Bokang, maybe I'll start with you. Any closing or final statements that you may want to put out there? I would just like to say thank you. This was a very informative uh, panel discussion. Um, I learned a lot today. I, also, I, I learned that also as a filmmaker, I have a personal responsibility to reach out to other organizations that could enrich the filmmaking, the, 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 the process of communicating through the art of filmmaking. Because that's, that's, I think art is a great conduit in terms of wrangling our culture and our heritage and mm -hmm. making it more palatable, regardless of how, how times change. Definitely taking more personal responsibility in that. And um, I would like to just, uh, to, what, to Sanele, just uh, say, Thank you, and uh, I'd like to encourage Channel to get involved more in product in projects of this nature because this is really the way as Africans that we can really just structure ourselves and build ourselves into exactly how we see ourselves or how we know we are. Amen, Kamal. All right, maybe if I could come. Thank you so much for that, Wakang, and thank you for everything that you're doing for telling the stories accurately. Blood Psalms, we can't wait. We cannot wait. So shout out to you. Maybe if I can come to you, Sanele, um, any closing or final statements? Uh, thank you so much, Wu. Thanks, uh, Bogang, Christian A, and Geraldine. Um, thank you to, you know, Credible for, for having us. Hololo, uh, I see you. Um, I think the main thing for me is that, you know, I'm driven by a deep passion to, to have us think as Africans become producers of our own culture, you know, so where we create our own culture and we represent ourselves. And that's what always drives me. So I'd just like to, to just tell everyone here that it doesn't, it might look mundane, but every bit of content, every story that you tell, every, every piece that you put together is, is a snapshot in time and it is, and you are capturing a huge part of who we are as people and representing us. So always keep that in mind and never stop creating or producing content. You know, you might think it's it's mundane, it's unimportant, but it does matter because someone will look back 20, 30 years from now, even you will look back 20, 30 years from now and say, hey, this is how we were. And I think it's really, yeah. really important for us to start documenting our reality and start documenting our culture and start documenting ourselves and representing ourselves and not leave it to some external force to come and do it for us because then they might skew the lens and then we get angry and we say, but this is not who we are. So let's take control of that ourselves. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sanel. You know, as you speak, I just think of Black Panther, you know, <laughs> Black Panther opened up the door for so much. Um, but most importantly, it opened up the door to dream, you know, that the main conversation that came out today is 
we need to view ourselves in a completely different way, in a way where we're inspired, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's a big job that you guys have as well, of course, as broadcasters, but you've been doing an amazing job so far. So thank you so much for coming on here and really sharing that experience. Highly appreciate it. Uh, maybe Dr. Geraldine, can I come to you? Any final comments or closing statements? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, great panel. Um, it's been really insightful. And I think from speaking from um, archive experience, uh, on the glam side of things, it's it's for us, it's about creating access in as much as we preserve the material uh, that we are the custodians of. It's also imp important for this historical and cultural material to be brought out of glam institutions uh, for the consumption of public. And it's for, for us to learn and to question, to interrogate and to reflect, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable um so you know these are the questions that we should be grappling with and definitely there's a need um to evolve now i would say um so yes thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel thank you so much dr geraldine your effort and uh, an insights and everything you've done to help us through this process has been highly highly valued thank you very much um Krishine, um can i please end with you ma'am and getting your final comments uh, and statements. Okay, so I mean, like, as I think throughout the discussion, the, the thing that's um, the phrase that's been running through my head is, you know, nothing about us without us. Um, and I think as from our from our side on the glam side, that's how we operate. Um, and I think that it's very, it now needs to link to the digital landscape and this evolution that we're going through. And I think um, the, 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 the people that we've encountered, met, been on panels with has been really incredible in terms of creating sort of not only sort of a national sort of network but a sort of a pan-african yeah. one as well um, and so I think that is incredible because we we are the authors of our own stories perfect thank you so much for that Christine and thank you so much from district six um, yeah you, you guys have also been amazing and we wish you guys the best we know that we're gonna hopefully through some these kinds of initiatives we can make sure ensure really really ensure that our culture and heritage that is held within district six goes nowhere instead actually it goes online that's the only thing that it should be doing that we should be bringing all of that online that's the only way it should be going so thank you so much again to the panelists for your time your insights and everything that you've done to make sure that we can help bring all of our information our data and cultural heritage to the forefront of the digital experience mm -hmm.